How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this episode 38 of the Sword of the Spirit podcast. This is Benjamin Naim here with all of you alongside Pastor Kevin Sepulveda of New Life Baptist Church coming to me here via Google Hangouts all the way from Australia. The wonders of technology here as I'm talking to him on this broadcast. It's Really great to get this opportunity. The point of this show really is to give you guys a chance to get to know Pastor Sepulveda and also what it's like to be an independent fundamental Baptist across the world, across the planet there in Australia. I'll be asking him about his church. We'll talk more about how he got into the ministry as well, more information about his church, how it started, what it was like to preach at the 2020 Missions Conference over in Tempe, Arizona, and wherever else this conversation leads us to. I'm really looking forward to it, but right now I'm not going to waste any more time. He's here with me, Pastor Sepulveda. Thank you very much for coming on to the show, and please feel free to correct my pronunciation of your name if I screwed it up. How you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be on your show. Thanks for inviting me. It is pronounced Sepulveda. There we go. Sepulveda. Now, here's the thing. You know, anybody from Los Angeles knows how to pronounce my surname because <laughs> one of the main one of the main streets there, Sepulveda Boulevard, I think it might be even the, one of the longest streets there in Los Angeles. Whenever I land into Los Angeles, everybody can pronounce my surname. But yeah, in other places of the world, it's it's challenging, I think, for some people. But you, you did a good job. Well, hey, I, I, <laughs> I gave it my best shot, right? A plus for effort. Can you at least give me that? Amen. Right. A plus. <laughs> well, Pastor Sepulveda, I want to thank you again for doing this. I wanted to bring you on here because, well, for several reasons. First of all, to give my audience a chance to get to know you a little bit. But I also find it interesting, quite frankly, I'll just go ahead and say it, to talk to foreigners every once in a while. My audience is mostly American, and I want to give them a perspective from countries across the world of what it's like to be an independent fundamental Baptist, and we'll be covering that throughout the broadcast. But first of all, because it's on everyone's mind and it's something that's obviously dominated the headlines as of late, the COVID-19 pandemic. I have to ask you this. How has coronavirus, just to start the show off here, how has coronavirus impacted you all the way there in Australia? Has there been a minimal impact, a massive impact? What, it's been, what has it been like to go through that pandemic over there in Australia? Well, compared to the rest of the world, Australia has barely been affected. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think we're just maybe just over 100 deaths wow. <laughs> since this pandemic started. I mean, it's it's had a very little effect uh, as far as people uh, catching it. But at the same time, we're also a very small population. You know, Australia's only got about 25 million in population. Um, the other thing about Australians, we don't tend to live in very dense environments. We're not of overpopulated in that sense. Uh, we're very spread out as individuals. And also, we're an island nation, so we don't have borders close to to other nations, obviously. You know, we're, we're an island nation. So I think Australia has been pretty safe, pretty protected during this pandemic. But that hasn't stopped the government from putting some pretty significant restrictions in place. Now, actually, we're, we are in the middle of uh, restrictions being lifted one at a time. So currently, uh, so for, for about... It's, was it about uh, five weeks? We weren't able to actually have church services. Uh, church services were were banned, um, and I, I hesitate to use that word because it's not like churches were targeted individually. Of course, this had to do with any kind of social public gathering. Uh, they were banned, so not just obviously uh, Christian churches, but all kinds of religious uh, gatherings, as well as sporting venues and um, even public parks. Anywhere where, where, where even beaches, beaches were, were closed. So anywhere where, where the public could gather in, in mass numbers, it was uh, restricted. And it was only, it's only been, uh, what is it, a week and a half since they started to lift the restrictions. So this past Sunday was the first time we could actually have church service proper, but we're limited to 10 people in our building. And um, so it's been interesting. I, I normally, we normally hold three services a week at New Life Baptist Church. Um, just pretty much standard as any other sort of church, independent Baptist church. But I've actually had to go to six services. So um, we've got two services on Saturday, two services on Sunday, and two services on Wednesday. 
And the reason for that is I've got a large family. I mean, my family, we're, we're 13. My, my wife and I and our kids, we're 13. So I can't even get my whole family to a church service, wow. you know. So uh, in order for my children to be able to get, you know, be in the habit of still being in church, I've had to go to six services. I'm still preaching three sermons, uh, but I'm preaching every sermon twice. And uh, the first time I preach the sermon, that's getting recorded. And then that's being uh, played onto YouTube at the same time as the official services so for the for the families that the church members that can't physically be in church because of the restriction, they can at least listen at the same time on YouTube. So that's been the restriction here. I also pastor Blessed Hope Baptist Church down in Sydney, and um, uh, currently they're having they've also had the restrictions lifted in their state, so they're having three services a week against restrictions of ten. But unfortunately, I cannot travel down to that church, and that's the saddest part of all this. Um, it's great uh, I've got some men that there that can preach. Um, in my absence, but I don't like the idea of the pastor being away for too long. I mean, we saw what happened to Moses when he was gone for 40 days. Yeah, right? messing <laughs> around with the golden happened. calf. <laughs> right, I'm not saying that's going to happen. At Blessed <laughs> Baptist, but, you know, I think there's a good principle there that, you know, a pastor shouldn't be that gone for too long away from his congregation. Sure. So what's it been like? Two service, or six services, two sermons. Has the second sermon been more exhausting for you? How? What's the time? What? How much time uh, is there between the two services? So uh, the services on Saturday are pretty much back to back, and it's just my family. Okay, it's just getting my family there. Um, and usually, when you preach something the first time, it's always the best because it's fresh on your mind. Yeah. You're you're looking forward to getting that out. And then when you have to sort of reheat it in the microwave, yeah, I mean, it's still got. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. But you don't feel like you you don't feel like it's the best, you know. Um, presentation of what you had prepared but I, the congregation can't tell the difference <laughs> obviously uh, so um it, it's been challenging with my first service with the family we only we want we are, we're only singing one hymn because um i feel like I, I was kind of losing my voice so we're just singing the one hymn getting the bible reading done preaching the, the sermon so it's with my family the service is a lot shorter but then when we obviously when i'm preaching to the rest of the congregation uh we have our standard services or about four hymns etc uh, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit tiring on the voice. That's what I've, I've got to admit. Yeah, I would imagine it is. But you're doing what you can do to keep the things going. Right. Here's, the, here's the thing, brother. I, I, you know, this is my only job. I, I don't have a full-time job. I don't have some part-time job elsewhere. I was speaking to a pastor friend of mine. He was going like, you're crazy, six services. And I'm like, yeah, but you've got a full-time job as well as trying to take care of your church. So, you know, um, it, it's all good. <laughs> Well, as I said, you're trying to just keep the train moving through all this, and it's definitely been crazy. A lot of different viewpoints, uh, and even among pastors, I respect every viewpoint. Uh, there are certain pastors who would say, hey, I'm not shutting my church down. Other pastors would say, I will uh, abide by whatever guidelines have been instituted. And one thing, and this is just my perspective, but uh, the way I look at it is, each pastor will do what he believes to be uh, the appropriate measure for his congregation. And although uh, lay people can play Monday morning quarterback and try and criticize and feel like they know what's best, ultimately I think you know, we should trust these pastors to do what they feel is right and uh, trust them to make the right decision. What's your perspective on all this? I mean, there's a lot of different people who are up in arms, a lot of people are upset. Others view this as perhaps having a biblical precedent in Leviticus chapter 13. What do you think? What's your perspective? What's your point of view? Yeah, I definitely take the Leviticus 13 and 14 approach. Um, when this pandemic started, what I found was a lot of people are focused on the virus. You know, is the virus legit? How deadly is the virus? And that's fine, you know, if, if that interests you. But the thing is, I always knew that I'm never going to get I, – I, I, I'm expecting to go to my grave not knowing – how legitimate this virus was. Mm. And I didn't want to base my decisions on how I felt about the virus because I don't know, you know, unless I'm a professional, unless I'm an expert, unless I can personally test people and, and see how legitimate and how deadly this virus is, I have to base my decisions on the data that's, that's coming through. And what we notice in the book of Leviticus, obviously, is that Within the law of Moses, there was a, the allowance of quarantine, not just the sick, but even the, the place that sick person was in, even a healthy person that may have been in the vicinity was also, uh, you know, quarantined for a brief period of time. 
And so I also believe in the importance of, you know, following the spirit of the law. And so I do acknowledge that our government has, you know, the God-given power to quarantine. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not in, I'm not saying that every decision they've made uh, that I support it. All I'm saying is that I support the fact that they've been given that power by God. And so they're the ones that are calling these shots, making these decisions. And I've just decided to rest on that. Lord, you know, God, he's given us government. He's, he's instituted that. It's not some satanic institution. It, it does come from God. They are given that power. Now, if they abuse that power, if they're lying, and I'm sure there are shenanigans going on behind the scenes. I'm sure there are things that are uh, wrong going on behind the scenes. But at the end of the day, I have to accept that the Lord has put government in power and with this power of quarantine. And so I'm simply just praying to the Lord. I'm saying to the Lord, you know, Lord, please keep them accountable. If they're doing right, if, if what they're doing is, if you know, if they're trying to protect their, their population, the community, well, then bless them. But if their purpose is to harm the people of God and, and, and his house, the church, then, uh, you know, bring swift judgment upon them. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm just leaving it in God's hands. And obviously I'm... I, People might say, well, you're doing nothing about it. Well, I'm going to the Lord God. I mean, there's no greater power than that. So I'm just waiting to see how the Lord steps in and sees us through. Well, I think it's a measured response. And one thing people have to remember is pastors and individual church members as well are responding in accordance to their perspective on quarantine in light of the Bible and also their perspective yep. on the virus itself. And just because a pastor decides to go to a live stream only format based on his view of those two things I just mentioned doesn't make that pastor any less spiritual or any less courageous than a pastor who decides to stay open. Each congregation will do what is best for that local assembly. And one attitude I think ought to be avoided is this sort of COVID-19 holier-than-thou mentality that says, if you respond to this different than me, then I'm a better Christian than you. What's your response to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, this is something that I preach on quite heavily in my church. Uh, God of the institutions, and I just spoke about governments, and there's obviously this family, and there's a father who's the head of the, the family unit. And then when it comes to the local church, the pastor has been given rule over that house. And so we have to understand that God has put um, leadership and, and those that are submissive to that leadership in place for different institutions. And so you have to allow your pastor to, to make a call. You know, my desire, my desire has always been to keep a clear conscience before God. You know, there are decisions I have to make as a pastor and I want to make sure whatever decision I make, I am willing to stand before God and have that clear conscience. And if I'm wrong, well, then Lord, the Lord can judge me and correct me. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I have a clear conscience before God, and I believe every pastor also has to take the appropriate steps they want to take to keep that clear conscience before God. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the nature of the Trinity. You know, even within the, the, the Godhead, you know, we see that the Father has the ultimate authority, and Jesus Christ submits his will to the Father's will. So, you know, even within the Trinity, and we see that, that chain of command, we see someone who is uh, above and, and those that submit to that will, and uh, this is the same with all institutions, whether it's your family, whether it's the government, whether it's the local church. You know, these things have been set up in the same way that uh, we can sort of understand the Trinity. All right. Well, thank you for sharing your opinion on that. I want to now play a small excerpt, a quick excerpt from one of your recent sermons just to give people a taste of your preaching. And then I'll ask you some questions on your church and we'll introduce the audience right. to that so they can check it out. We'll plug the YouTube channel and all the rest of it, of course, but uh, let's play this here. How will you be remembered? Play maybe 30 seconds or so so people can see what it's like to hear Pastor Sepulveda. About 30 years later, Jesus says about the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So what does Jesus say about the Laodicean church some 30 years later? Jesus wasn't even there. All right, Jesus was outside, as it were, knocking on the door. Hey, guys, let me in. Hey, guys, oh, great, you're having church service, but can you at least worship God? Can you at least mention my name? 
Can you at least pray my name? Can you at least preach the things that I taught in the Word of God? Hey, they had forgotten all about Jesus. They made it about some activity, some social gathering. They totally forgot to the Lord. They totally forgot the Lord some 30 years later after the book of Colossians. All right. What? Good point there. You probably you couldn't hear it, so you, you don't know what point I'm even talking about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> amen to what you said. Some dynamic preaching from Pastor Sepulveda. Pastor, your church, New Life Baptist Church, let's talk about it. How did this get established? Can you give some background information on what led to the opening of this church over there? Give the city that it's located and the backstory of your church. Yeah, sure. So New Life Baptist Church is established in the Sunshine Coast of Queensland. Now, the Sunshine Coast is quite a smaller city in comparison to some of the other cities in Australia. It's only got about 300,000 people. So I think it might be like the um, the ninth largest metro you know metropolis sort of area of Australia. I'm originally from Sydney, so Sydney has like five million people. It's our largest city. Um, but I had a desire to start a church and be a pastor, and um, you know I, I basically I, di I didn't know where to start a church. I was looking at Adelaide, and Adelaide I think it might be the f the fifth largest city in Australia. And we even took a family trip to Adelaide, but the traction just wasn't there. And I was simply praying to the Lord and asking, can you show me where we need to start a church? Where would be the right place? And I didn't want to start a church where there were other good Bible-believing, King James-only, soul-winning churches. I really wanted to find a place where it really hasn't had too much of an opportunity of, of people going door to door preaching the gospel. And so uh, through many, many months of prayer, the Lord eventually led me to uh, meeting a friend who was from the Sunshine Coast, and he was looking for a good church. And I pointed him to one of these churches. And uh, what we found later on, that this church was a hardcore Lordship Salvation Church. There was no soul winning. And uh, I believed at the time that this was probably the Lord's leading. Maybe this, maybe the Sunshine Coast is the place to go. I've never been, I've never personally been to the Sunshine Coast before start, uh, come to start this church. So I thought maybe that was the answer to prayer that I was seeking. Uh, interestingly, uh, I think it was like a month after this, my parents decided to holiday to the Sunshine Coast. They had a, they had a friend that lived here, and they've never been on the Sunshine Coast. They've never expressed any interest to visit the Sunshine Coast. But they phoned me up, and they, they said, look, uh, we're going to the Sunshine Coast. Do you want to come along with us? And look, this is a 1,000 kilometers away from, I don't know what it is in miles, but it's a 1,000 kilometers from <laughs> Sydney. So it's, it's like a 12-hour like drive. And um, I just thought, wow, this is interesting, you know, uh, the fact that this has come so quickly. And I was just, yeah, it was just through this process that it seemed like the Lord cemented this place for me. I'm not saying that I saw some vision and the Lord <laughs> said, go to the first. But obviously, as someone that's seeking the Lord's guidance, I'm, I'm asking the Lord for the best place to, to go. I'm seeking his, his leadership. Then obviously, the Lord's going to answer that prayer. And he did it through this process. Um, so there were some other things that came about for me to confirm the Sunshine Coast. And eventually uh, I started to meet different people, uh, different uh, be believers that are like-minded that may have listened to new, new IFB preaching, uh, started to come together, started to meet. And before you knew, before I knew it, you know, I was expecting to start a, a church from scratch. But I think our first service, we had about 60 people <laughs> on our very first service. And we currently average somewhere about 50, 50 people in the congregation every week here. So that's why the Sunshine Coast. Um, but a part of me always wanted to leave Sydney. <laughs> there was always just a bit of a desire for me to, to, to find another place. And I'm really thankful to come to the Sunshine Coast. It is a bit of a tough area for soul winning, though. But that's one thing that I have to admit. Mm. Well, let's talk a little about your background as well. You definitely meet yep. the qualification that says have at least two children. Let's count here. One, two, three, yeah. four, five. There's a baby, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think you passed that one with flying colors, Pastor. So yep. you have a big, you have a big <laughs> family. Talk a little about your background, where you grew up, and what eventually led to you getting ordained and becoming a pastor. Yep, sure. So in that photo that you just showed, uh, my wife's actually pregnant in that one. So all, right. all 11 children there, and the 11th child was uh, born about four weeks ago. So it's now it's 11. Now we've got to update that photograph. Well, congratulations. Um, <laughs> thank you. 
Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a, a, a long story. Um, I grew up as a Baptist. My, my parents, uh, since the beginning, we were attending a Baptist church. But the type of Baptist church that we attended was uh, a Baptist union church. You know, this would be something similar to your Southern Baptists mm. um, okay. from, from your perspective. And so, I mean, it was decent. I remember the very first pastor that I had was very old school, King James only, some hard preaching there. I really I did learn many things from that pastor. But once there was a change, it, it became very watered down. Um, and even with the new pastor, I'll never forget. I was only I was only about 12 years old. I'll never forget the pastor's son got behind the pulpit and preached that Roman Catholics. And I, I remember this because I was excited to hear a sermon about uh, Catholicism. I had Catholic friends. And I wanted to win them to the Lord. So I, I, I came to that service, pen and paper at hand. I wanted to know how to win the Catholics to the Lord. And the sons, the pastor's son preached that, well, Catholics are our brothers in Christ. You know, we're becoming a bit more like them. And they're becoming a bit more like us. What? And as a child, I was just so discouraged. I said to myself, I will never be a Baptist. Because that's what I thought. <laughs> <Gave a bad laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> um, so through my teenage years, and listen, I, I got saved when I was four years old. My mother mm. gave me the gospel at a very early age. I mean, even a four-year-old can understand the gospel. A lot of my children have been saved about the age of six or seven, five, six, seven. One of my sons got saved at four years old. So the gospel is so simple that if a child just has enough understanding and, and understands what Christ has done for them, where they can believe this. And I, I was definitely saved at four years old. I thank God for that because that I had the Holy Ghost residing in me. And even when I was, you know, even when I heard a sermon like about the Roman Catholics, you know, there was something inside of me that said, no, this is wrong. This is this is heresy. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily that I was raised with great Bible knowledge. It's obviously the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the new man that was telling me this is this is wrong. And uh, so eventually, you know, uh, in my teenagers, I was trying to find the right church because I didn't want to be a Baptist. <laughs> I, I met my my future wife and she was a Roman Catholic and I started to date her, which, by the way, is wrong. You shouldn't date a non-believer. But I, I thank God because, uh, you know, within a few months, she did get saved. She was the first soul that I was able to get saved. And, uh, you know, dating her obviously was a lot more comfortable. Well, once she got saved, I knew she needed to get baptized. In fact, I needed to get baptized. I had never been baptized. We we're trying to find the right church to attend. And uh, we eventually found ourselves in our very first IFB church. So I was... Um, I think I was about 20 years old when I got I, I, I attended my first IFB church and my wife and myself got baptized. My wife was able to win her mother to the Lord. And so her mother, her brother and herself got uh, got baptized all on that same day. And I'm really thankful for that very first um, church that we attended. Um, you know, those first two years in that church w w were the foundations of my Christian faith. Like I, I owe a lot of who I am today to those two years I was in that church because I've never heard preaching like that before. I've never heard the Bible taught that way. A lot of the fundamental doctrines were just established uh, for me. It's the first time I've ever gone door to door soul winning in that church. Um, it really made me who I am today. And I'm really thankful still for that church. Not only was I baptized there, but my wife and I were wedded there as well. As well. So our pastor conducted our, our wedding there. Um, the reason we did leave, uh, it was called Bethany Baptist Church. It's called Southland Baptist Church now. The reason we left that church, we were struggling with a bit of fellowship. Uh, that church was roughly 90% Filipino. And nothing against Filipinos, but obviously when you when you have a great uh, number like that, uh, it can be difficult as a non-Filipino to sort of fit in sure. to the environment. So we were finding, looking for an IFB church that was a little bit closer to us locally, and we found Victory Baptist Church. And uh, we attended Victory Baptist Church there for about nine years. But going back to Bethany Baptist Church, because I heard such great preaching, I even learned, you know, what it means to be a man, you know, to, to find work and provide for your family and, and all these kinds of great truths. I, you know, because I had learned so much, my desire was to one day become a pastor. I didn't know what that would look like. I didn't know how long that would take. I didn't know if I had to go to Bible college. I, I wasn't sure about any, any of these things. But I, I knew that one day I would want to be a pastor. And uh, so that's where the seeds of this grew. Um, but one thing that this is going this leads into things later on. But one thing I could not understand was the pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> I could not, you know, the future events. I, you know, I was, I was, I said to myself, I need to ground myself on all these key doctrines. I tried to ground myself on the pre-trib rapture. I couldn't see in the Bible. But instead of thinking that the preaching was wrong, I just thought I'm stupid. 
That was the conclusion that I came to. And uh, I just said, well, you know, I'll put this aside. I'll just focus on other doctrines of the Bible. And one day the pre-trip doctrine will make sense to me. And so later on, I attended Victory Baptist Church, as I explained. Uh, we were there for nine years. Uh, I served two years in that church as a deacon. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to see things behind the scenes and just to be a support to our pastor there. Um, I think I was a, a Sunday school teacher there for about four years, approximately. I, I don't remember exactly four years. So that was great as well because, you know, for, for, about, for about three of those years, I was preparing lessons every week. So that was, that was a great part of, you know, preparing to preach on a weekly basis. And obviously preparing, uh, preparing messages for the children. I was also having the opportunity to preach on a monthly basis by my, by my pastor. And my pastor also spoke to me a little bit about becoming an assistant pastor in the future. That was something that he sort of saw myself becoming in the future with his church. And so I was getting a lot of great opportunity. Not only was I, was I the Sunday school teacher, but they eventually made me the Sunday school superintendent. So I was overseeing all the classes. And so any assistance the teachers needed, they would come to me. I would organize the resources. Uh, the biggest issue that I saw with the Sunday school class, though, is I realized that a lot of children that were going from Sunday school into the main services were finding church boring mm. because they were used to the fun games and the lollies and, yeah. and, you know. So one thing that I wanted to make sure was our, our oldest class, which was the 12-year-olds, I wanted to make it more like church. So it was less games, less mucking around. It was more like a church service to help them transition to uh, proper church. You know, that, that was one of my main goals uh, during that time. But I really appreciate Victory Baptist Church. I was given a lot of opportunities to minister, to preach, to serve in the church. And I got to know, you know, what it is like to, to, to be a real faithful member, attending faithfully, but also serving the people. And uh, that, that was uh, a great opportunity for me to learn I already had the fundamental truths in place, but how to be, the, a lot of the teaching was about being a, a, a godly father, a godly husband, being a family man. And so that really helped me with my family and, and you know, raising them faithfully. So I was never in a rush to be a pastor. This was a long time thing for me. I was just happy to work in my job and um, to be a godly husband. So what led me to leave Victory Baptist Church was the pre-tribulation rapture. Um, I had already approached my pastor about maybe one day being ordained and sent out. And uh, before being um, asked to become a deacon, I actually approached my pastor and told him, look, I actually no longer believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I believe in a post-trib pre-wrath. Maybe I'll give you a bit of that story as well. So I was trying to work out why the pre-trib rapture. I felt like I had most doctrines laid out. I just needed to understand the pre-trib rapture. What I decided to do was listen to preaching of contrary views. So post-tribulation rapture, my goal was to debunk those positions so I could be better grounded as a pre-tribber. That was my goal. And that's where I came across preaching from Pastor Stephen Anson. Now, when I first heard his preaching, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> I actually thought he was a Ruckmanite. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Wow. I, you know, I just wasn't familiar with him at all. But I heard him preach on the rapture. This was maybe 2010, roughly. I heard him preach on it on the pre-raph rapture, sorry, and um, and it all clicked. It all made sense. All the doubts that I had, it just started to fit. All of it started to fit like a glove. But even then, even after I listened to that sermon, it's not like I just immediately changed. I spent the next six months just in my Bible, just going through it myself, and I had no other conclusion but that the rapture would take place after the tribulation and before God's wrath. Now, I knew I couldn't go to my pastor and change his mind about it. I, that wasn't my goal. I never went around the church teaching it or giving out DVDs or anything like that of Pastor Stephen Anson's preaching. But when I was nominated to become a deacon, I decided to approach my pastor about this because I, I, I felt like I needed to be open about that. And I, told, and I told him, I said, look, if this means I can't be a deacon in the church, that's fine with me. I, I understand that you've got certain standards and I'm not trying to change the church whatsoever. My pastor came back to me about a week later and said, look, that's fine if you believe that. As long as you're not going around the church teaching it, we're happy for you to become a deacon. And so that was a process. And so my conclusion was if they were satisfied with me being a deacon, well, the qualifications for a pastor aren't all that different. <laughs> so I thought they'd have no problem with me believing they post tree pre raph rapture sure. and being a pastor. But once we got to that point where I was talking to them about this, uh, they basically told me that, as far as we're concerned, you meet all the qualifications. We'd love to send you out, but we can't do it because of your position on the end times. Mm. 
so that was a very sad time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I can quickly just tell, you know, I, I remember just driving to work that, that week and I had to stop my car, pull over, and I just started to shed some tears because I didn't know what God's will for me was at that point in time. And I just prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what this is. If I'm wrong in the rapture, can you send someone with the Bible and, and show me where I'm wrong? Number two, if you don't want me to be a pastor, can you please remove that desire from my heart? Or number three, if your desire is for me to still become a pastor one day, can you just open some door? Can you just make something happen? Right? I had no idea what that might look sure. like. Well, about two weeks after I prayed that prayer, uh, a mutual friend of mine and of a man named Victor Tay approached me and said, well, have you heard of Victor Tay? He's been sent out by Lighthouse Baptist Church which was pastored by a man who was best friends with my first IFB pastor. So I knew of Lighthouse Baptist Church and he was being sent out and he said, look, he believes end times just like you do. You should get in contact with him. And so that's what led me to eventually become a member of the church in Punchbowl because what I saw at that point was this was an answer to prayer. I had gone to the Lord and said, look, is there some other way? I had never known of Victor Tay. I didn't know that he was being ordained to send out to start a church. And so I eventually ended up in the church in Punchbowl speaking with Victor. We went soul winning together and um, and I, I spoke to him about my situation. And he basically said, yeah, you know, if you're faithful to the church, you can prove yourself here. We would happily send you out one day to start a church and pastor. So that's what led me to the church in Punchbowl. And then about, I think it was about two and a half years later, I was eventually ordained and sent out to start the church, uh, New Life Baptist Church in Queensland. Well, I appreciate you going over that. With regard to the pre-trib rapture, I've heard so many stories of people who go to churches who believe in the churches that affirm the pre-trib rapture, and it really has never gone... I've never heard a story that had a happy ending with respect to them. Mm. It's typically that people who believe in the pre-trib rapture end up, in some cases, getting kicked out of church or completely, if they were in a leadership position, losing their leadership position. But I definitely, I can see why, as you held that pre-trip position and trying to strengthen it, ended up switching your view once you saw after some sermons that had the opposite view. Because the reality is, and I don't mean any offense to any pre-trip brothers and sisters who might be watching this, but there really isn't scripture at all to... Uh, substantiate that position. You have some pictures or parables that you could maybe use to try and corroborate it. You also have some really bad arguments like Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 claiming that that somehow is the rapture and things of that nature. But the post-trib pre raft position has so much scripture associated with it. The Olivet Discourse, you can actually just, hey, admit that it's talking about the rapture. And see, well, look, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of, the day, of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And it goes on. But my point is this, the mountain of evidence, the preponderance of evidence is on the post-trib pre-wrath side. And it seemed like for you, Pastor Sepulveda, that was sort of a fork in the road moment. Do you compromise on that or do you stick with what the Bible says and potentially face some issues well it seems like it all worked out for you in the end where you didn't have to necessarily compromise on your view on the rapture and you ended up uh, getting that ordination anyway and and it seems you know god did want you to be exalted to this position yeah i, I believe that you know even when i left victory baptist church my pastor sat me down and he said to me he sat me down just personally just one-on-one -on -one for over an hour and he said look i cannot ordain you but you will become a pastor and so what he did for the next hour was just guide me into being a pastor, all the challenges he has had. He said, look, you're going to have some challenges. Even people within your congregation will go, come up against you from time to time. This is how I've managed it. These are the verses that have been supportive to me. He gave me all this great counsel and advice. And so, you know, I could see that within his heart he was torn. You know, he, he couldn't send me out. But at the same time, he wanted to bless me. He wanted me to to uh, serve the Lord of my life. And, um, yeah, it, I, I can see, you know, I, I would never criticize him uh, because I can see that he's, you know, he wanted to keep some type of integrity within his church. 
but he also wanted the, the work of the Lord to progress and move forward and for people to get saved and all these things. So I really appreciate my pastor there. I, I could never say a, a bad word about him. Well, I want to address the elephant in the room. Obviously, Victor Tay is uh, not a friend of the new IFB anymore and uh, I believe has a heretical view on the Trinity. What is your view of his church now? So I've had to break fellowship with Victor Tay. Um, now, a lot of people misunderstand this. They think I've broken fellowship with Victor Tay and the church in Punchbowl because I've gone, I've followed after Stephen Anderson. But here's the thing, you know, even after the, the big controversy with Tyler Baker and Victor Tay and Pastor Stephen Anderson, you know, I, I broke fellowship with Victor over a year after that controversy happened. In fact, you know, even to the day of my ordination, I believed Victor Tay, you know, had a correct view on the Trinity, but just had some misunderstanding or uh, maybe used the wrong terminology to describe the Trinity. And the reason for that is because where the church in Punchbowl was established, it's one of, you know, as far as Australia is concerned, it's one of the most dense places with the Islamic faith. And so we'll constantly go and door to the we'll, you know, part of the gospel presentation with, with Muslims, we don't say Muslims in Australia, we say Muslims. <laughs> uh, we would have to constantly explain the Trinity. You know, so I, I had personally gone with Victor Tay. I've heard him explain the Trinity. I've never heard anything heretical about that. Many people in that church, I had to explain the Trinity over and over again. The difference was I was already familiar with oneness theology. One, one of my best friends from Victory Baptist Church has um, family that, that are, are oneness. And I remember him, you know, we had lots of discussions about this. So I was aware of the, the dangers of modalism. And I actually didn't even know the term modalism, but I was aware of oneness. Um, so I knew a lot of the false uh, doctrines that came out of that position. And so um, I remember when, when Victor Tay preached one of his sermons, I got my friend to listen to his sermon on the Trinity because he's impartial. He's not, he doesn't, he's not a new IFB listener or sure. anything like that. And he said to me, look, it sounds a lot like oneness. But I know it's not oneness. I know I know he believes the Trinity, but it just sounds a lot like oneness. Well, s subsequent to that first sermon, Victor Tay corrected some of these things or preached uh, about, you know, the Lord being three. And so as far as, you know, for me personally, I wasn't even in the church when this all went down. I was actually overseas in South America, Chile, where my, where my family live. And uh, so I wasn't even boots on the ground when all of this was going on. I was three months away. So I wasn't even, I didn't even, you know, have a full picture of what was going on at the church in Punchbowl. And um, I also was limited on my internet. So I had like 3G on my phone because I was living in a, in a country town when, and the internet kept, you know, it, it was ne never reliable. So I was trying to listen to, you know, sermons just on my phone and, and trying to catch up on videos. I couldn't, and it was very expensive, you know, to keep recharging that 3G connection so I could sort of follow on in all the drama. <laughs> And so uh, what I understand today, and this has taken time, and it's obviously Victor has also uh, developed his view. It's not like he had this view when he started. It's something that he's developed over time. Even he would admit to that, was that today where, where it stands is he believes one can hold the position of the Trinity as well as oneness theology at the same time. You know, we're generally those that believe in oneness are against the view of the Trinity and those that believe in the Trinity are against the view of the oneness he takes the position that you can believe both at the same time, which is, you know, it's not logical. It's not logical at all. Yeah, so, that doesn't even make any sense. I don't like that yeah, guy, so, but I will say this. You you took a stand on the Bible, and of course, the trolls are going to claim that you're mindlessly following Pastor Anderson. And that happens anytime, every time hmm. you decide to mark and avoid somebody. It's about the doctrine. The Bible says in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. I've had to do this. After the steadfast split in Jacksonville, I marked and avoided numerous people, not just for heresies, but also because of the insurrection they were trying to orchestrate against an ordained mm -hmm. pastor based on the railing allegations of an individual who turned out to be a Judas Iscariot named Adam Fannin. And because I took that position, I was also accused of blindly following a man and all the rest of it. But that's what they're going to do because 
they don't recognize at the end of the day what you're doing is standing on scripture but they discount that because they don't see it it's not scriptural to rebel against ordained leadership i didn't want to be part of Korah's rebellion and with you you didn't want to be in fellowship with someone who held a biblical position or doctrine that you found to be anathema so look i can relate but haters gonna hate right exactly exactly and actually my, my first interaction with pastor anderson was i went to the detroit it was it was a soul winning conference i think yeah um, in detroit i was there and yeah okay cool even at that point i was still in fellowship with victor tay and i had an interaction with pastor anderson and i was defending victor tay <laughs> to pastor anderson i don't know if, i don't know if he, he remembers that conversation at that time and um you know this is the thing about that i've learned about pastor anderson he said to me look you know what if you remain friends with victor tay that's not my business i think you're a good guy i've never heard you preach heresy you know i'm, I'm happy to be your friend <laughs> so you know it was quite interesting because uh the, the view that people may have is that you know stephen anderson is trying to manipulate you or trying to you know get you on his side i i, I had none of that experience you know pastor anderson just reached out try to, you know, as, as a friend. And uh, I really appreciate that first interaction that I had with him. And, um, you know, even at that point, I was still, I still believed at that time that Victor Tay uh, had the correct understanding of the Trinity, just had, just was using wrong terminology, uh, et cetera. So maybe there was a bit of, you know, ignorance from my end. I hadn't fully grasped what he was teaching. Uh, but at the same time, you got to re remember that, you know, you tend to want to give people the benefit of the doubt. You're always extending, as a believer, you're trying to extend grace to people. And, you know, even myself as a preacher, you know, I've, I've gone back and listened to my preaching. Sometimes I've misspoke. Sometimes I've said something and I've cringed. I said, did I really say that? I didn't mean to explain it in that way. Um, so you always want to try to extend a bit of grace and uh, to people. But what, what happened after that conference were a few of the families had left the church in Punchbowl. And they were trying, that, that, that's in Sydney, and they were trying to find a church to attend. Some of them had stopped soul winning. They weren't even in, you know, it's not a church split. It's just different families were leaving at different points in time over this, this situation. And remember, this is like a year later. This is not all when it's all happening. It's about a year later. And uh, I was very saddened by that state because these are people that I cared about. These are families that I knew. And they weren't even aware that others were leaving the church. And so I made the commitment to them that for, for now, I was willing to travel down to Sydney. I was flying down every week, flying back up. I was spending basically 24 hours in Sydney every week to run services for them, to keep them together, to keep them soul winning. That was my heart, my heart work for the people. And to see, you know, it was a bit of a Band-Aid solution. I don't know if, if the, my, my thought at that time was that we could find a good church they could all attend or whether this could eventually become its own church. And uh, so... You know, that's eventually that's that eventually became Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And right now there's about 50 people in that church as well. So uh, the Lord's really blessed the work there. And, um, you know, the, the soul winning going on there, people are getting saved. And so I'm really I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be able to pass these two churches. But my desire is to find a pastor for that church and there because it is a long distance to travel. And they really do need that full time pastor looking after that church. Hey, I know someone else who pastors a couple of churches. Happens to be my pastor, <laughs> Pastor Jonathan Shelley, right. in charge of both Steadfast Baptist Church and Pure Words Baptist Church. And Steadfast does have a satellite in Oklahoma City. So something you two have in common, I'm sure you can have uh, some pretty good discussions on that. And, and he certainly would relate to your situation being in charge of that other congregation. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. For sure. Well, let's talk about the spiritual state of Australia. You're coming to me all the way from there. Thanks to this wonderful piece of technology known as Google Hangouts. The Bible says in Psalm 33, verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. I can tell you that for the United States, this country does not have the Lord Jesus Christ as its Lord. America has spit in the face of God. I believe it is Mystery Babylon, in fact. The United States is promoting wickedness and filth and Hollywood degeneracy all over the planet. And that's why pastors in this country, at least in our movement, 
don't hesitate to preach against it. The spiritual state of our country, though, is such that at the very least, we still have the freedom to go out and preach the gospel and get some people saved and preach what we would like to behind the pulpits of America. But it doesn't mean we're headed in a good direction. And in Steadfast Baptist Church, we're actually working on a documentary called The Sodomite Deception, which shows how America has degraded on that issue over the years and makes some other points as well. Is Australia sort of in that same boat? What's it like in Australia in terms of the spiritual state of that nation? I think everything that you just said about the United States is true for Australia as well. All right. I mean, I, I think I think Australia is just heavily influenced by United States. Well, whatever whatever the United States does, Australia follows. Sure. So you guys started with your you know uh, with abortion laws, mm. and then Australia follows. You know, the United States started to allow homosexual marriages. Australia then follows. Right. I mean, it just seems like whatever America wants to do, Australia says, yes, sir, that's what you, that's what we're going to do as well. And so Australia has been polluted with, you know, the Hollywood and, and, the, and the, you know, the pornography that comes from the United States. And uh, so it's, it's not all that different, you know. Um, Australia, the, the, yeah, there definitely once was, I'm not saying we were ever a Christian nation. I'm very hesitant to use that term. But there was once a fear of God. There was once a, a respect for the Bible. There was once, you know, the, the, whether, whether our stores were closed on Sundays because what people did on Sundays was attend church. Well, that that fear of God has been lost in our nation uh, completely. So I just feel like Australia is, is similar to the United States. But I would say that Australians generally have less of a fear of God than what Americans do. Mm. And the reason I say that is because just in my experience of door-to-door soul winning, you know, people still get saved here, no, no doubt. But I've explained this in one of my sermons that, you know, it takes about three or four gospel presentations in full in order for you to see one salvation here in Australia. Whoa. So that's, that's been what I've seen down in Sydney. That's what I've seen here on the Sunshine that's Coast. A, that's a big difference. You, it's a big I, difference. I cannot say the same for, for us here. I, I typically, one, one presentation typically gets the job done. Correct, correct. So I, went, I remember when I went to that soul winning conference, I heard Pastor Anderson say something along the lines of, when I give the gospel in full, I expect that person to get saved. I think he had, had like a 100% hit rate. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, man, am, am I that bad at giving the gospel? <laughs> but here's the thing. I've obviously gone soul winning in the United States, uh, in Detroit, Sacramento, uh, Phoenix, and I think somewhere in Ohio. And seven gospel presentations, seven salvations. There you go. It's not you, it's them. <laughs> Right. So obviously there is a, there is a, a difference uh, with, with how people uh, think of the Lord and, and the fear fear of you know hellfire and these things. So you know I I, I think man the, the United States is the United States is such a ripe place for soul winning. But then when I hear Americans, they're saying man you know the Central America and the Philippines that's where it's receptive and it's not receptive in the United States. And what's funny about that is I've got a friend here, or I've got a church member here who was living in the Czech Republic for two years. He was there soloing two, uh, every week for two years, and he had four salvations in two years. And he's an experienced soul winner. Wow. <laughs> he's a real experience. And, he, you know, in the Czech Republic, four salvations, could you imagine that, of two years of soul winning every week. So when he comes to Australia, he thinks, man, it's so receptive in Australia. <laughs> so really, <laughs> it's your perspective. It's it's what you're familiar with. You know that, that will help you determine uh, how what you think of people and their and their fear of God. But you know, because your 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 audience is mostly American, I would definitely say that Australians have a have less of a fear of God. And part of that is because we are part of that is because we are so comfortable. We are a very rich nation. People don't go without. I mean, when I've when I've gone to the United States, I, I, I'm surprised by the amount of homeless people that you just see on the streets. Mm. You really don't see that. I mean, I'm not saying it's not there, but you you barely see it in Australia. But, you know, you can't even if you don't want to work, the government will give you a house and money. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people just have it easy here. People have money. People are taking holidays. People are taking it easy. And when life is so easy. Why do you need the Lord? That's that's the view that many Australians have. Sure. Yeah, sorry about that. For some reason, your audio just, like, the volume went up to, like, level 200 for a few seconds there. It just started blaring, and then it went okay. back down and get some little glitch. Okay. Are you familiar with 
Pastor Logan Robertson. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. So. Um. A few years. Yep. Well, here's what I was going to ask. A few years ago, when he was working on a Muslim or a documentary about the religion of Islam, he got into some hot water because he was trying to interview some people at a mosque, and the media showed up. They basically tried to paint him as this horrible monster. They even tried to claim that he was a racist and tried to smear his name. He ended up appearing on Alex Jones's show, actually, back when that was a controversy. And he talked about Muslim immigration and things that were going on related to that. Pastor Robertson, when that was going on, I remember putting out a video in support of him and just trying to be an encouragement to him. My question for you is this, though. After that controversy, just seeing the way the media responded to it, it seemed like Australia, and, and the United States is in the same boat, but it seemed like Australia, like a, lot of, like a lot of European countries, has a very high rate of political correctness in the sense that saying anything slightly controversial or slightly outside of that deviates even slightly from the mainstream view could get you into some trouble. Is that the view that you have? I mean, what's it like there in terms of people's, uh, I guess, their response to Bible preaching? Is it a hyper-politically correct society, a hyper-liberal society at all? Huh, that's, a, that's a tough question. I, I, wouldn't, I would say Australians aren't politically correct. Okay. I mean, Australians are very free with their mouth. But what I would say is that there are two groups in Australia that are very protected. That's the Islamic faith and, and homosexuals. Gotcha. So just speaking out against, against these two groups will land you in hot water. Okay. So, but when it comes to just other aspects of life, I don't think Australians, Australians are politically correct in comparison to the to United States. I, I, um like I kind of said, we're very laid back. Uh, Australians are very flippant with their mouth and uh, we're very easygoing people. And you don't really get in a lot of hot water unless you're someone potentially with, with a lot of influence, maybe uh, someone like we've had recently, uh, one of the, the, the football sporting stars get in hot water because of his views on homosexuality. But generally speaking, uh, pe you know, pastors across this nation are still preaching against that. They're still preaching against the Islamic faith. Um, I suppose once something becomes very public in, within those two groups, then you're going to be called out by the media. But at this point in time, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of um, persecution or uh, prevention of being able to speak. You know, we don't have the same free speech laws that United, the United States has. But it doesn't look like there's any real enforcement of trying to prevent you from saying things or teaching different uh, passages of the Bible. So um, I, I can't relate to that completely. Um, but I am familiar with Pastor Logan Robertson. When he first came into Australia, um, I actually picked him up at the airport. And I think he was detained for about nine hours. So I was waiting for him for nine hours. He started his church about an hour and a half from me uh, down in, Bris in Brisbane. I was actually uh, planning on starting a church in Brisbane. About, but then uh, he he eventually started that, and the same people that were going to be part of that church became part of Pillar Baptist Church there. Um, so yeah, I, I I've even had the opportunity to preach there uh, once. That was after Pastor Robertson was detained, and you know to sort of encourage them. I sort of encouraged them, we were praying for them weekly when they were arrested, and um, I even went to their trial, the final uh, court date that they had, uh, and to be a support to the to to the brothers there that were facing court charges. So um, the reason he was uh, deported was simply because when he came from New Zealand, he came on a uh, limited visa. He had a lot of conditions. So one of those conditions was he couldn't be a troublemaker or something mm. along those lines. So the, the Australian government felt that he had uh, broken those conditions, and that's why he was deported from New Zealand. Uh, but I don't, I don't expect that all pastors, especially if you're an Australian, that if you, if you did something similar, I wouldn't expect that you'd get in the same level of hot water. I think it's because he was coming from New Zealand on a limited visa and uh, he was an easy target, right. let's put it that way. So the immigration status played a role in his situation, but yes. natives probably wouldn't get uh, that, wouldn't have to suffer that, that fate. So that's good news. Who are some of the major false prophets in your area? We have plenty of them 
here in the United States and pastors here will preach against them regularly, but is there an Australian equivalent or equivalents multiple that you could think of that you could clue the audience in on? Well, I think the, the most famous church in Australia that's been founded in Australia is Hillsong. Okay, and so Hillsong's <laughs> were founded by Brian. I didn't even know that. Brian. I didn't think they yeah, were yeah. founded there. Yeah, yeah, in Sydney, Sydney. Wow. Uh, it's first church. I think um, I wrote this down because I knew you were going to ask me. So uh, we've, there's 80, 80 Hillsong churches worldwide. So it's quite a global church. It's had a great, uh, well, great, sorry. It's had a big influence um, on Christianity. It even has an in- influence in independent Baptist churches. There are independent wow. Baptist churches in Australia that are trying to follow that format, you know, going to the conferences and trying to see, hey, how have they been so successful? But, of course, it's a false gospel. I mean, they believe that uh, basically it's not salvation by grace through faith alone. They believe you have to become a disciple of the Lord. You have to follow after the Lord. And they believe that you can lose your salvation. So if you don't live by a certain standard, then, you know, you've lost it. So it's not salvation based on the finished work of Christ. It's based on the work of Christ plus on works. Wrong. You know, you've got to meet some sort of standard. Without it, you'd lose your salvation or not be saved. So, uh that's Brian Houston. And um, the other big church that we have in Australia is the C3 Church. Have you heard of C3? I personally haven't. Okay. Well, C3 has a lot more churches worldwide. They've got, um, they've got 500 churches worldwide. And uh, C3 is founded by a guy called Phil Pringle. And the reason they're called C3 is because they originally, they originally called the Christian City Church. So you've got the three Cs, Christian, City, Church, and then, then they just... Call yeah, themselves like there's C3. one in Fort Worth. Yep, they're, they're all over the place. So uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, um, again, founded by people that came from a Pentecostal mm. uh, background. Hillsong was founded by a guy that came out, that came out of the Assemblies of God. Uh, but this guy also has a Pentecostal background. What's interesting about both these founders, they're not Australian. <laughs> they were both from New Zealand. So they've come from New Zealand. They've established churches in Australia. They've taken off. They've had a global impact but both of them basically teach that in order for you to be saved you have to become a disciple a follower of jesus christ and it's not based on the finished work of christ alone through faith Uh, so those are definitely the two biggest churches that have the most influence here in australia so hillsong not only are they a bunch of effeminates with their queer sounding music and skinny jeans and limp wristed fake pastors getting up on a stage with purple lights and smoke but they also promote a false gospel that says you could lose your salvation. That makes me hate them even more. And that's all I really have to yeah. say about that in response. I've got, I've got, one, of the, I've got one other man that you might um, Go I'd mention. His name is Alan Miller. And he, he's, got a, he's got a compound about three hours from where I am. And this guy claims to be the reincarnated Jesus Christ. <laughs> he's one of these. <laughs> so he, this is another, obviously, not just a major false prophet, but this is a false Christ. This is an antichrist. And his partner, or I don't know if it's his wife or his partner, she claims to be the reincarnated Mary Magdalene. And so his background, he was once an elder of, that's it. There you got it up there, Divine Truth, Alan Miller. And uh, they were he was once the, an elder in, at, um, of the Jehovah Witnesses. So he's gone, he's gone nuts. He believes it's Jesus Christ. He's not, this guy doesn't have a huge influence, but he's someone that does pop up in the media, especially when people are trying to expose you know, false Christ on the earth. So we do have an Australian false Christ as well. <laughs> well, hopefully God opens up some kind of sinkhole or something and takes him out very soon. Absolutely. The Bible says Absolutely. in Matthew seven fifteen, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They exist all over the place. So I just wanted to see what some of the big ones were there in Australia. Here's a fun one for you. Is there mm-hmm. even such thing? This is going to come off as a very dumb question here, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I've never even heard of it. Australian food. Is there such a thing? Uh, not really. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> we're good. We're quite a young nation, uh, but there are some staple foods that Australians are known for. And I think the most famous one is Vegemite. So Vegemite is a type of, it's a yeast-based uh, spread that you'd put on bread. And, you know, I looked this up just for this interview, but right. about, 39%, about 39% of Australians eat Vegemite on a weekly basis. 
But myself and most other Australians, we just find it disgusting. It's very, it's very salty. Um, it looks like Nutella, but it's definitely not. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it's pretty, pretty gross. So um, you definitely want to try it, though. You definitely want to have at least one opportunity to, to have, a, have a try of it. One of the other uh, uh, sort of foods that Australia is known for is the meat pie. Uh, so it's just a pastry with with minced meat inside. Sometimes there's mashed potatoes in it as well. And the reason Australians are known for this is because it's very different to the pies that Americans have. You know, usually the pies you guys eat are very sweet, uh, whereas this is more of a savoury type pie and you would put uh, tomato sauce or what you guys call ketchup on top of the pie and you eat that. That would be something similar to, you know, what hot dogs for you guys. You know, you'd, yeah. you'd eat it and, you know. Um, and then when it comes to dessert, there's a type of cake called uh, pavlova. And um, it's not really a cake, but it's sort of made from egg whites and sort of like this. And uh, it's sweet and it's topped with fruit and, um, and whipped cream. That's a very popular uh, dessert in Australia. Though the New Zealanders claim that it's, it comes from them. It's sort of a bit of a fight between Australians and New Zealanders as to where the pav- pavlova comes from. But I, I would really encourage anyone and try the pavlova. That's that's brilliant, delicious. And the other dessert that Australians are known for are the lamingtons. So it's a it's a small sponge cake, which is coated in chocolate and coconut flakes. It's called a lamington. Another I, I love eating lamingtons, so that's that's another good one. But yeah, as far as, as far as traditional meals and food, no. <laughs> okay. I wasn't you know, sure, but I figured I would ask. Australians are made up of, you know, it's very multicultural, a lot of immigrants from different places. And of course, they've brought their foods. Great. Well, I ask because, of course, you went to the mission conference. You preached at the missions conference earlier this year at Faithful Word Baptist Church. And that was an event in which cultures were on display of different countries. And I tried to do that here on this show when I get some foreigners on and ask them a little bit about their culture. But what was it like? to preach there at the Faithful Word Conference. Looks like the sermon title was Australia, the Dry South Land. I do remember watching it, and there's the proof. You could see the red line. So I did watch, <laughs> it looks like, most of it there. You didn't finish it, though. I didn't finish it, so there, you, you caught me. I'll have to finish it. But, <laughs> Pastor, what was it? Man, that's embarrassing, isn't it? Pastor, what's it like yeah. to have gotten that opportunity to preach at Faithful Word, were you nervous at all? I'm sure it was a big crowd. Just talk about that experience. Yeah, so um, I received a text message from Pastor Anderson just telling me that he was planning on on doing this conference, and he asked me if I was willing to come and, and preach at it. He wanted an Australian-flavored sermon. Um, he gave me a little bit of, you know, uh, where to lead. He really just wanted to be about Australia, what, what it's like to be a soul winner in Australia. So I really just tailored it around that. And uh, it was quite nerve wracking. Um, as you know, you know, our time difference is very different. So I think I only landed the day before. Mm. And so it takes time, you know, I was, I was very jet lagged. <laughs> I'm the kind of guy that I need a solid eight hours to really function the day. Yeah. So when you're, when you don't have the right kind of sleep patterns, it, it's challenging. Well, I felt like I, I managed quite well with the jet lag, but obviously preaching in front of, I think it was like, somewhere between 400 and 500 people. I've never had to preach to a number that that large. So it's kind of nerve wracking. But, you know, with the help of the Lord, you know, I'm always, I, I always get nervous. If, even in my own local church, before I get up to preach, I'm always nervous. I always have to ask the Lord, you know, please empower me, please strengthen me, help me to, to preach something to your people here. And so once you get into it, you're fine. Uh, but I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. I was able to meet, we had some other Australians from our church attend the conference as well and um, there were some other Australians there in in, um, in attendance as well so that was a great opportunity it was great to meet some of the other pastors and and meet many other like-minded believers everyone was very encouraging everyone was very friendly and um, yeah I just I really enjoyed it and um, I'm looking forward to my goal is to sort of go to one of these conferences not necessarily to preach at them but just to attend one of these conferences every year if possible uh, because you, you do get refreshed with the preaching, but not just the preaching, but just, just the fellowship with other like-minded believers is it, such a valuable thing. The fellowship and the conference itself really does 
refresh, jumpstart, energize your Christian life. I felt it. I've been to a number of them already, including the Soul Winning Conference you had mentioned earlier on in the podcast. And the fellowship is great. You feel this camaraderie, this unity with a bunch of like-minded believers coming from all over the world. And you make memories that, that last a while. I make sure to document it, take a lot of pictures, get to meet people who I've only spoken to on YouTube or the internet or Facebook in some way. And it's always a lot of fun. I, I honestly felt left out. I, I have something called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. I will admit it. I haven't been diagnosed yet professionally, but I've self-diagnosed. And I definitely felt like I was missing out as I was watching from my living room here the 2020 Missions Conference. I hope to be able to make the next one. And hopefully you're there as well and, and I could meet you. But uh, it looked like it was a, a lot of fun. And you're right with regard to these conferences. For those of you who haven't been to one, I'm sure Pastor would agree, hey, don't miss out. Make sure you can at least go to one a year because uh, you won't regret it. And, Pastor, an added bonus, I've met a lot of people, single men in particular, who ended up meeting their wives at a conference, specifically the Red Hot Preaching Conference. So you never know. Right. Well, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, I think it, was, it might have been the last day of the conference. There was a couple that is in my church, Blessed Hope Baptist Church down in Sydney. I did and they got see engaged. that. So, yeah, they didn't meet at the conference, but they got engaged. They got at the engaged. Conference. Yeah, I remember seeing that. So that's, exactly. that's so, really cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to wind down here. I had one final question for you. It's a question I like to ask pastors who I get a chance to interview. And it's a simple one. But of all the different subjects that you tackle in your preaching, is there one topic that you would say you enjoy preaching about the most, whether it's a hobby horse issue for you or anything at all you would point to and say, yeah, that's definitely my favorite thing to preach on? Definitely. Um, this might sound boring, but actually it's so important. And that I love preaching about the difference between the old man and the new man, the flesh and the spirit, and that constant battle that we have, sure. that dual nature. That dual nature, if it will, as a believer. And the reason I, I, this is so important is because there are believers that are saved, but they start to maybe doubt about their salvation or, or, or doubt whether the Lord is using them because they've still got that old flesh and they haven't understood that the reality of, of the Christian life is that you've got this dual nature that's constantly at war and they've heard sloppy preaching, they've heard bad preaching where they think that old man is, 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 is done with and there's only the new man. So when they get back into some of those old sins and they're not serving the Lord, they've lost excitement for the Lord, they may feel that, well, am I truly saved? And they start to have these doubts. And so I think it's so important to preach about the fact that there is the old man and the new man and that we need to walk uh, or put on the new man or, or walk in the spirit. Because at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to every sermon, every sermon can be summarized to put on the new man, walk in the spirit. So if it's a sermon about the need for prayer, well, you need to pray in the new man. If it's a sermon about soul winning, the only way you can be effective is to be soul winning in the new man. You know, when it comes to uh, just serving the Lord, hey, we can't do it in the old man. The old man is looking for the praise of men, but the new man is seeking to be praised of the Lord. So, at the, you know, when it comes to that very fundamental truth, and even your Bible, when you read your Bible, you know, if, if you don't understand this very important fundamental truth, it can lead you to, to misunderstand, like in 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 First John, where it says that that um, uh, I, I can't quote it right now, but it says that if you've been born of God, uh, you know you, you sin not. Yeah, whosoever's born so of God does have, not commit sin. Not, yeah, yeah, does not commit sin. That's it. So people don't understand that that has to do with the new man. The new man is sinless, right? And so when we do sin, it is done by the old man. It is done in the flesh, and the new man remains sinless. And so it's, it's understanding this very fundamental truth that will help people to even just read the New Testament properly. And, and uh, yeah, so that's definitely my favorite subject. Just to piggyback off of what you said, Galatians chapter 5 says in verse number 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would and then it lists it lists what some of the works of the flesh are and what the fruit of the spirit is as well later on in the yeah. chapter which this passage would make no sense if once you got saved you just automatically put on the new man and automatically walked in the spirit 
without any free will on your part whatsoever, why is the Bible commanding us to do this if it's something that just automatically occurs once you're saved? Something that I haven't really heard uh, a proper response to, because at the end of the day, that's not biblical. You have to choose every day to mortify your flesh and walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 7, of course, is a good place to go to as well. Yeah, I like that subject a lot. I'm glad you brought it up. And it's often misunderstood, Pastor, as well, by a lot of people who would teach that once you get saved, you'll just wake up one morning and you'll go soul winning for three hours and read your Bible for another three hours and never miss a church service and pray for another four hours and just always be walking in the Spirit and putting on that new man and everything changes. No, no, no. It takes work. Sanctification is a process, but salvation happens just like that. Amen. That's right. Pastor, it was a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I really appreciated the chance to ask you some questions, not just about yourself, but also your church. Give the audience an opportunity to learn more about you, learn more about your church. Let's do some plugs to close things out. If you would, please plug your YouTube channel so we can get everyone to go hit that subscribe button there and check out some of your preaching. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You just go to YouTube, type in New Life Baptist Church or type in Pastor Kevin Sepulveda. You'll definitely find the channel there. Uh, if you do want to subscribe to our, our church and in Sydney as well, Blessed Up Baptist Church, again, just just uh, do a search for that. Or if you just want to go to our website, it's newlifebaptistchurch.org.au. So that's the best way to, to reach out to us or to find us. All right. And I am actually pulling up your channel now just to give the people a visual. This is it. Let's, oh, I haven't even subscribed. Wow. All right, here we go. Let me fix that. There we go. All right. Subscribe to this <laughs> channel, folks. If you want to hear more of Pastor Sepulveda's preaching, the sermons are uploaded here. You got to know him here on this podcast. Now support his work and Blessed Hope Baptist Church as well. Make sure you hit the subscribe button there and support that ministry. Like I said, I do appreciate you coming on here, Pastor Sebulveda. Thank you for your time. Anything else you wanted to say before I wrap it up? No, not really. Just uh, thank you so much for having me. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm, I'm very open with, with my past or, or anything like that. And, um, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new subscribers if anyone wants to sign up. Uh, but just once again, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be able to uh, explain this uh, through a different channel, I suppose. Yeah, my pleasure. Always interesting to get the perspective of an independent fundamental Baptist and a fellow brother in Christ and a pastor coming all the way from Australia. That's a very, very far trip. Uh, I'd love to go out and visit sometime and take a flight over there and, you know, check out what's going on in that nation. But until next time, folks, this is Benjamin Naim signing off for Pastor Sepulveda. Thank you very much for tuning into the show. You can check it out every Monday night at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern Time at youtube.com slash Ben the Baptist. God bless you all, and we will talk to you guys again after a while. <laughs>